Hello and welcome to attending the Save the Frogs webinar all about Belize. Today we're going to learn about amphibian ecology and conservation in Belize. And we're going to talk about the status of amphibian conservation in Belize, what Save the Frogs has been doing in Belize, and you'll learn all about our amazing eco-tours. So my name is Michael Starkey and I'm Save the Frogs Advisory Committee Chairman and an Ecologist. I've been traveling to Belize for over about six years now, and I've seen a lot of amazing amphibians, and I've also learned a lot about the conservation efforts that are happening in the country. But first of all, it's important to know that Belize is a young country. Formerly British Honduras, Belize uh, got its independence from Great Britain in 1981, and we're in the Yucatan Peninsula in Central America, right beneath Mexico and just east of Guatemala. And so it's a very small country, but has some pretty nice amphibian diversity. Some important things to know about Belize is that there's a small but growing population. It's estimated that there's between 350,000 and 400,000 people living in Belize, but it's estimated that by 2020, there will have about 1 million people living in Belize. Now, the rainforest is quite intact, but it is threatened. Um, like many countries in Central America, there is an issue of over harvesting of timber and clear cutting of the rainforest. But because Belize has, for the most part, maintained much of its rainforest, still much of it is intact. And the biggest import to Belize is ecotourism. And it's pretty easy to see why. It's a beautiful country. It's known for its great diving and tropical beaches. Um, it's right on the coast of um, one of the largest barrier reefs on the planet. It has a rich uh, diversity of culture um, from the people of Garifuna or Creole, or the Mayan or Mexican descent. It has many Mayan archaeological sites that are well maintained and preserved. And the wildlife is incredible. So from jaguars to scarlet macaws, the diversity of wildlife is incredible. Now, amphibian conservation in Belize is somewhat of an interesting issue because not much is known about the amphibians of Belize. Now, it's estimated that there's about 38 different species, but that's just because scientists have yet to do so many formal surveys because many of the areas that are protected in Belize are actually quite remote, and unfortunately, scientists have not been able to survey them. So it's estimated, though, by scientists in the country that there may be 60 to somewhere as 80 different species of amphibian in Belize, but we have yet to identify them all. Now, like I said, little is known about these species because it's hard to find them uh, where, you know, in these remote areas. But so far, there's about 40 species that have been identified. Now, like many countries around the world, Belize has quite a few species of special concern. Um, with about 15% uh, that are actually listed in some way as threatened, vulnerable, or as might even be critically endangered. And this is just um, adding to what's happening around the world. You know, there's about 7,000 species of amphibians on the planet, and about 2,500 to 3,000 are threatened by extinction, meaning their populations are in decline. Now, this is happening for many reasons, from a worldwide habitat destruction, over-harvesting, climate change, and many different factors are co combining, um, combining themselves to have synergistic effects. So they're having combined effects. That's why we're seeing a decline in the overall population, population of amphibians around the world. Now, and just like around the world, the same thing is happening in Belize. And the number one threat is habitat degradation. Where people go, they tend to drain wetlands, clear rainforests for cattle agriculture or farming. Um, and we've seen you know, quite a bit of this happening in Belize. And with that estimated population growth of 1 million people by 2020, we're going to see more forests being taken away. Now, species depend on pristine forests to survive. And there's a lot of farming efforts that are highly unregulated in Belize. And on this photo, this is an example of just a subsistence farm um, of coffee, actually. And so many people don't think about where their food comes from. And, you know, a lot of these things that we cherish, like coffee, for example, are grown in Central or South American countries, and they grow in rainforests. But they have to clear quite a bit of the rainforest, spray lots of pesticides, and clear the leaf litter. Now, this leaf litter is very important for amphibian species. Uh, many depend on this leaf litter to lay their eggs in, to hide in, and many species, such as the chalks rain frog, depend on 
this forest leaf litter to survive. And this species is actually uh, listed in Belize, so its population is also declining. So habitat degradation is a big problem for amphibians of Belize. Now, however, though, there is a high level of habitat protection, and we can thank this big kitty here. You know, the jaguar is a species that ranges as far north as Arizona and parts of Texas and travels far south into South America. But in Belize, it actually um, is known to have the first established jaguar preserve. Now, the Belize government established a corridor throughout most of Belize, especially in central Belize, of contiguous habitat, so intact habitat that's protected. So there will be no development, no clear cutting or anything like that. And the whole idea was to preserve the biodiversity of the forest with the main interest of the jaguar. Jaguars require hundreds of miles to find prey and meet other jaguars to breed. And so they need lots of habitat. Now they act as a flagship species and by protecting all this acreage for the jaguar, we protect much more habitat for tapirs and other animals, including scarlet macaws, and also our beloved amphibian. So we can thank the jaguar for that great protection of habitat. Another big threat to amphibians in Belize are um, the spread of pesticides and pollution. Um, much of Belize's farming efforts go highly unregulated and pretty much anything can be used as to use on crops for pest control or fertilize these crops. And so much of it is sprayed over the crops and when it rains, it drains off into you know, wetlands and streams and it gets into the, you know, the amphibian skin because amphibians are highly susceptible to pesticides uh, because amphibians act like little sponges. So their skin is permeable, meaning they literally drink through their skin. They soak up water and nutrients, but they can also absorb toxins and chemicals like what we find in pesticides. Now, amphibians' deformities have actually been observed in Belize. And much about in the United States, we've seen the deformities that are coming from too many chemicals out into a water body. And it literally affects the genes and changes the, the growth of the, um, the amphibians. And so we observe these deformities in the United States. Now the deformities in Belize have not been directly correlated to that with pesticides because there's been a lack of research on the subject. But we're finding though that it's the same kind of things we're seeing in the United States. And so it's only a matter of time before we prove that this is coming from the high use, high unregulated use of these chemicals in Belize. And infectious disease is also a potentially very threatening issue for amphibians in Belize. The, the disease in question is the chytrid fungus, which is responsible for the extinction of over 100 species around the globe. And 300 plus species of amphibians have it around the world, have been detected with this fungus. Now, unfortunately, at the time being, it has not been detected in Belize. But neighboring countries like in uh, Guatemala and Mexico are definitely been confirmed to have this disease. And so it's theorized that Belize does have the disease, but because again of a lack of uh, study in the area, not enough samples have been identified. And so we have not proven that the fungus is in Belize, but in all likelihood it is, and it is most likely affecting amphibians there. But further research on the subject will tell whether or not um, the prevalence of chytrid, um, I guess what, what the issue is for the amphibians of Belize. So it's only a matter of time before we find that out. Now, Say the Frogs has been traveling to Belize since 2012. Um, and the first time that I went there, I went around the country and gave presentations and met with biologists in order to spread um, Say the Frogs mission in Belize. And so a big campaign was just simply public education because most people do not know that amphibians are going extinct. Uh, it's just something that is not discussed in the country, but Belize is a hotspot for uh, conservationists and environmental um, efforts having to preserve this uh, country's biodiversity. And so amphibians fit in with that, um, these, um, these topics. And so I traveled down there to give presentations and network. But also it was important to broaden Belize's network of students, academics, and biologists, or anyone interested in amphibian conservation. And so I've given dozens of lectures in, in Belize just to spread this message of the amphibian extinction crisis and further the conservation efforts that are geared towards amphibians. 
Now, also while I was there, I was training field biologists and other staff from nonprofit organizations that work in the country. Many of these people are working with larger animals like jaguar or tapir, but they're not looking at amphibians. And so now they're able um, to go out into their study sites and find amphibians and take data on them and see if there's any trends, if you know if they're seeing more amphibians one year, less the next year, and start developing surveys so they can get a baseline for future years um, to see what the amphibians are doing. And so uh, this was a, we've held quite a few workshops in the country and I will be giving more in the future as well to train staff and other biologists about amphibians. Now, also a big part of the work of Save the Frogs is to work with the next generation. So getting students involved because they are the ones that will be inheriting the problems of tomorrow. Uh, and so we need to invoke a culture of conservation in these students because if they don't care about these animals now, they're not going to care about them when they grow up. And so, for example, in this photo, I'm giving a talk in a remote village of Blue Creek to the school. And so I spoke to about 70 Mayan children about frogs. And it was amazing because many of these students, um, well, they don't think about amphibians too much. Many of them think about frogs just as, you know, this is something I throw at my sister. Um, they're just not appreciated in that same way. Um, but the, these kids were so excited to see this talk, they even carried their own chairs to the presentation. So it was quite an experience to give these talk, this talk to these children. And hearing 70 kids make frog calls is a pretty remarkable sight. And um, I've been coming back to this village for about every two years for the last six years. And these children still recognize me when I come into town. And the way I know they recognize me because they're very quiet in general, but you'll hear one make a frog call, it'll turn around and call back, and then they giggle and run off into the forest. So it's a pretty rewarding thing to be able to have these uh, opportunities. Now, and so we're developing more educational um, programs and educational literature for students that they can take to the schools and spread around with their families and friends, just so they know about amphibians and they can appreciate them more and learn about them because they're learning about metamorphosis, and amphibian life cycles and how it ties into the big picture. So developing that. And while I was in Belize, I was able to give uh, a great talk to the Belize Zoo's conservation camp. And this conservation camp, they have students from all over Belize just learning about wildlife and what they can do to protect it. And I had kind of an interesting encounter with the students and I'd like to share this with you now. So I'll go ahead and play this. So guys, uh, I heard lots of frog calls up here. So, so that frog that I was doing last night was called a tungra frog, and so it sounds like if I'm one frog and I'm gonna call my other frog friends, I'm gonna start calling and I expect to call back. So when I go, and it, I hear, and then now it would all happen at the same time, right? It'd be about like a bunch of different times. So if one starts calling and another starts calling, it happens all at different times. So join in whenever you feel right. Seriously, getting students to make frog calls is probably the highlight of my life, but moving on. Another thing that we're doing in Belize is to promote environmental stewardship. Belize has a culture of wanting to protect the forest, protect the, the, the barrier reef, but unfortunately there are still some things though that kind of get lost in, um, in this effort to take care of the environment. And so while we're in Belize, we do promote environmental stewardship in every way. This is an example of that. So this is the dump in Punta Gorda, which is in uh, southern Belize. Now, unfortunately, what happens is when you go to the dump, you basically just dump your trash off the side of the road and then it is burned. Now, that's not a permanent solution of dealing with waste. And so promoting more environmental stewardship techniques is one thing that Save the Frogs does, teaching, you know, the importance of reusing items and, you know, recycling if possible. Belize is just now starting to develop a recycling program. Um, and so we're trying to promote this as much as possible. However, like I said before, there already is a culture of uh, conservation. 
And many people are working to make Belize a nice, cleaner, greener place. And so around Belize, you'll see things like this, um, which is a sign in Placencia, which is on the coast. And it says, show your love for to see and to green, no throw trash, keep the scene clean. And very simple, great way to educate people about, you know, the importance of taking care of the environment. So, and Save the Frogs is on board with this and we're trying to promote it as much as possible. Now, and this is a group of students that I spoke to in, um, it is in near San Ignacio, which is right on the Guatemalan border. And these are a group of uh, high school students that were basically just young conservation biologists. And so we were just talking about how to further promote this, uh, you know, idea of environmental stewardship and taking care of the environment. And one of these students in, in particular actually gave me one of my taglines that I give for my talks, and it's make conservation habit. And so this one uh, girl, just ex she asked this question about why isn't it a habit to take care of the planet? And she just kept saying that, like, we should make conservation a habit. And so I believe very firmly in that, say the frogs believes very firmly in that, is that individual action will literally, it, it does make quite a big difference. And so everyone should invoke in their lives this, this idea of making conservation a habit. And when we see the world before us being turned into a trash dump, you know, it, it is up to us to make because every little step makes the world a better place. Now, we also have quite a few campaigns to protect amphibians. And so some species are not thought too much about. Uh, and then some actually get quite a bit of negative intention. Like this is the marine toad, also called the cane toad. Now, the cane toad is famous, or I should say infamous, because in many countries around the world, it is an invasive species, uh, especially in places like Australia, where it's causing quite a disaster for the native ecosystems. But in Central and South America, the, the marine toad is completely native, and, and it should, should be cherished as well, because it's one of Central America's largest toad species. They're quite charismatic in my opinion and i love their grumpy looking little faces and they have these huge poison glands on their the, on the side of their head and so they're pretty interesting and cool but unfortunately they come into conflict um, with people because they do quite well in urban settings and they really don't actually get in conflict with people but they get in conflict with people's pets namely their dogs because when a dog finds a cane toad, they'll bite them and chew on them, and the toads puff up, and they squeak. They actually, if you pick them up, they let it, they emit a distress call, and they kind of act like a big, giant squeaker toy. Unfortunately, that poison in the back of the toad will kill those dogs in one hour. And so people get quite upset when they keep losing their dogs. And so they do kill the toads quite indiscriminately. And so we try and solve this in a few different ways but one is that we you know we write articles and we give presentations talking about the importance of these toads because the cane toad while it might be a problem for dogs it's actually great at keeping down mice and cockroach populations which are things that people definitely don't want in their houses uh, but they also eat the very dangerous fertilants so cane toads have been observed to eat juvenile fertilants uh, which is a venomous snake and is one of the most dangerous snakes in Central America, Belize included. And so we teach um, people how to make, you know, toad friendly houses. And so, you know, basically all the people have to do is sweep them out away from the house, watch their dogs more, clean up their yard so it doesn't attract toads, like leave, um, pick up standing water, things like that. And then the toads will go away. And so we wrote an article just, you know, talking about this in the San Pedro Sun, which is a uh, newspaper that um, is on the island of San Pedro. So we're still working to protect these guys. They need our help quite a bit. And we're also working to inspire the next generation to appreciate, appreciate nature and wildlife. Because like I said before, they, you know, they will be working on tomorrow's problems. And so we've got to get them liking frogs and loving frogs. And so they'll want to take care of them in the future. We also are working on some field research in, the, um, in Belize. Uh, for the last two years, I've been working with Belizean herpetologists trying to get a survey uh, off the ground in the Maya Mountains. Now, this would to be to detect chytrid fungus and also look for new species of amphibians. Because, like I said, there's not much work being done currently in the country to uh, study amphibians. 
And so this idea would be to look for these new species because they're out there and see how they're doing as well. Um, unfortunately, though, funding has been a big issue. And so we have not been able to get the funds off the ground to conduct these surveys, but hopefully in the future we will. Uh, and I was a part of one of the first amphibian surveys in Sarstun Tamash National Park, uh, which is in southern Belize. And as you can see from the photo, it was uh, quite an experience. We had to take a boat um, from the town of Barranco out to this uh, marsh estuary type area. And it's basically a flooded forest and during the wet season. And so we're waiting out there looking for amphibians. Um, oil drilling has become a big thing in Belize. And they found oil on the coast as well as inland. And this is actually a um, amphibian survey for uh, actually just looking to see what species were sensitive because they're going to begin drilling in this part of the area. And so the idea is to see if there was any critically endangered species or anything threatened before they begin construction. So there are quite a few conflicts with wildlife and it should be known that, you know, when people expand out into the forest, they're bound to run into some issues. And, so there's been quite a few amazing stories of conserva or, um, conservationists and uh, other people helping wildlife because you know they get in the conflict and these animals have to go somewhere or be rehabilitated. And that's why um, there was the creation of the Belize Wildlife Conservation Network. And it's a group of different NGOs and individuals that are all working together to help Belizean wildlife. And so Save the Frogs is a part of this by giving lectures to these groups and uh, trying to be uh, helping the amphibians in any part that we can. Now, I want to discuss the frogs and toads of Belize. And so while we've spent time in Belize, we've been able to see many different types of frogs and toads. And so these two individuals are Mexican tree frogs, and I'll talk a little bit more about them in a minute. But there are many different amazing types of frogs and toads in Belize. And like the one I mentioned before, the marine toad, also called the cane toad, is the largest toad that we find in Belize. I guess it's actually the largest amphibian that we find in Belize, um, at least in size, um, because there are some other interesting Sicilians, which are a long snake-like amphibian that probably a little longer, but definitely not as heavy. But marine toad is an awesome toad. They're very common around urban areas, and you'll definitely see them when you come with us to Belize. Um, they are a native species to Belize, like I said before, and so um, unlike in other parts of the world, uh, you can like them in Belize. Now, there's another species called the Gulf Coast toad, which um, they call the Gulf Coast because they're on the Gulf Coast, and they are very, very common as well. And they're known because they have small little poison glands, and they have this very spiky pattern on their backs and legs, and that is to actually break up their pattern and their silhouette upon the leaf litter and they blend in looking like a leaf. Now, they come in many different colors, which is always exciting from reds to golds to browns. They're very, very beautiful toads um, and a common one that you'll see in Belize. And like I was talking about those Mexican tree frogs, they're also called um, Bodens tree frogs. They're um, a very pretty common tree frog, big, about the size of a palm uh, and absolutely beautiful. And they come in lots of different colors as yellow, well, yellows, browns, and and this very, very beautiful green coloration. Right underneath their eye, they have a beautiful green fleck um, that's almost fluorescent. It's quite gorgeous. If you're very lucky, you'll be able to find the blue spotted tree frog, which is a species of special concern in Belize, um, and namely because of their habitat is disappearing, because this species uh, depends on tree hollows that fill with water to lay their eggs in. They really like that habitat. And so if trees are being cleared, these frogs don't have a place to lay their eggs. And so a very cool frog, they um, also will lay their eggs in little puddles. So they depend on you know, good habitat to lay their eggs. And then if you're really lucky, you get to see these amazing guys, um, the pepper tree frogs or baned tree frogs, absolutely beautiful. Um, I mean, just look at that eye, just a very, very beautiful coloration. And a cool thing about these frogs, and actually I learned this the hard way, um, I had one of these jump on my face one of the first times I went to Belize. Uh, I was on a tree and I was looking at it too closely and then it looked at me and then jumped on my face. And after it had jumped off my face, um, a few minutes later, I started having an irritation in my eyes. And they have a, it's not a necessarily a true toxin, but it's some chemical in their skin that it will irritate your eyes and produce a histamine-like reaction. So important thing to know when 
ever you handle amphibians is that some of them actually do have little toxins or irritants in their skin. And so it's best to keep handling to a minimum. Also really important that we actually do much more harm to them than they do to us uh, because we have oils that on our hands that get in their skin or, you know, if we have bug spray or uh, suntan lotion, things like that, very easy to soak up that amphibian skin. So it's best if you ever, ever handle amphibian, wash your hands with water and keep your hands wet and keep handling to a minimum. It does stress them out a little bit. And then we also see lots of yellow tree frogs, which is a very common species in Belize. Um, absolutely. I mean, called yellow tree frog because they're quite yellow and they're very, very common. This little male is trying to attract the mate and they do a very good job of it. And he was so distracted, he didn't mind me catching a good photo of him. And then another really cool frog you find with the yellow tree frogs in big ponds are Stoffer's tree frogs. They're another neat frog that you can easily catch a photo of calling. They get quite distracted. Um, and just give you an idea what these guys sound like, they're quite cool. So another species we have is the rain frog, um, the genus Crogaster, uh, formerly Luthodactylus, um, is a type of leaf litter frog as well. They depend on great leaf litter in forests and uh, usually near streams. Um, this is another species of special concern. Um, and also uh, a Luthodactylus leporis or the model tripping frog is another species that's um, not doing very well in country. Um, but it's, again, it's this loss of habitat. And many of these species are also affected by the chytrid fungus. And some more common species that we have are the foam frogs, Leptodactylus fragilis. Uh, they come in a variety of colors from browns and golds to fluorescent red. They're a very, very beautiful frog, and they're quite tiny. Um, so they're about the size of a thumb. Um, very, very, very cool type of frogs. They call them foam frogs because this genus, they lay big foamy nests that they lay their eggs in. And so they usually um, lay in them and lay about two to 5,000 eggs. And it's pretty neat to see their foamy little nests, very different than the frogs back in the United States, which lay big jelly-like egg masses. And so you can find these during the wet season breeding like crazy, very cool frog. And then if you're really lucky, you'll see the famous red-eyed tree frog which is the symbol of the rainforest. Um, we have many of them in Belize. They like to breed in uh, big open ponds and they'll be high in the canopy all year round. And then when the summer rains come, they come on down and they breed um, a few meters above the pond where their eggs will drip into the pond below when they hatch. So a very beautiful frog and we always love finding them on our trips in Belize. And some of the larger frogs that we have in Belize are the leopard frogs, and a common one is the real grand leopard frog, which is probably the most um, uh, widespread in distribution. They, they're named after the Rio Grande River in uh, Texas, uh, bordering Mexico, and they, um, they stretch in down to Panama. They're a really cool frog. Um, and another species we have is the valiance leopard frog. Uh, characterized by males having bright green heads. The juveniles also have bright green heads as well. Uh, they're our largest leopard frog in Belize. They get very, very big. And one of the coolest frogs in Belize, and is my favorite, is the Maya mountain frog, also called Julian's frog. Now, this species is endemic to Belize, which means that it is only found in Belize. And so that makes it very, very special for the people of Belize. They do celebrate this frog a little bit. Unfortunately, it's quite hard to find. You have to go to some remote places to find this frog, but there's a very special place that we go to in Belize where we can see them almost guaranteed. Um, so we love this frog and only found in Belize. Now, Save the Frogs has been traveling to Belize for the last two years. And the first time we went there was in 2013 and it was a huge success. We had a great group of individuals come down and we traveled all over the country. And it was amazing. And it was so good, we had to go back. So this past year in 2014, we had an amazing time. And we think that 2015 is going to be even better. 
And there's many places that we go to in Belize, but why Belize is a question I get quite a bit. And well, there's lots of frogs. Um, Belize has a good amount of frogs, and it's a very easy country to get around to. They speak English, which is a, a, a plus for me since mi español es muy malo. And uh, so we go find frogs and have a great time. There are many places that we travel to in Belize, but along the way, we like to make stops at some of the Mayan archaeological sites. And the site we go to is Shunantanich, which is on the Guatemalan border, um, called Stone Lady is what Shunantanich means. It's uh, an ancient Mayan city. It's a few thousand years old, and it's a great way to take in the amazing Mayan culture in Belize. And then we also spent some time in pr pristine old growth rainforest in the town of Blue Creek. Now, named after the nice blue river that runs through the city or the village, um, we like to stay at the Blue Creek Lodge, which is quite remote uh, and away from noise and lights. Um, and it's a very beautiful place to hang out. So we like to describe it as a little rustic. It's dorm style housing, but the scenery is absolutely incredible. We, you know, take dives off the dock, um, go for many long hikes, go bird watching, or go for a nice dip in the rain. Uh, being in southern Belize, it does rain a lot, so during the day it'll be quite hot, but then you usually get some nice afternoon rains, and it's pretty intense to swim this heavy, heavy, heavy rain, and it's very, very fun. Um, and so the accommodations are quite nice and simple, but, you know, when you're sleeping in a rainforest, I couldn't have it any better. Um, it, Blue Creek is a great place to unwind and detach away from civilization and really find yourself. There's many opportunities to do that, um, whether that's taking a hike, going for a swim. So, and we are guided by some people that live in the village. Um, the, it's a Mopan Mayan village. And they take us around on ethnobotany walks where we learn about the plants and um, what the, their traditions are with these uh, plants and how they use them for medicines or food or making their homes. And then they also take us bird watching. And we'll also go check out the Blue Creek Cave, which is where the mouth of Blue Creek River runs, runs from. Now, the opening in this cave is incredibly huge and monumental. But we aren't always able to get to it because when we go in the wet season, the river is pouring so fast out of it that sometimes we're lucky to go in. If it's uh, a mellow year, we can even swim up into the cave at, um, with headlamps, which is really amazing. In 2014, unfortunately, we weren't able to do it. We weren't even able to get up to that far because the river was so intense. But it still makes for some great photos. And if we don't make it to the the wet cave, we'd always go to the dry cave. And so getting to the back of Blue Creek Cave, um, there's an actually an, another entrance into the cave because a whole, you know, uh, myriad of cave systems and, you know, uh, it's like a, just a kind of checkered throughout the forest. And so some of these caves go in quite a bit. And so it's a hike to get up to the site, but it's a pretty fun experience. And we're able to hike in about a quarter mile into the cave and, you know, see some amazing structures and there's bats in there and lots of different uh, cave uh, animals that, you know, make this dry cave their home. It's a very cool experience. Now, we also like to see some frogs, of course. We're going to Belize to find amphibians and Blue Creek is a great place to find those wonderful marine toads I was talking about. And so it's a great place also to handle an amphibian if you've never seen one before. The cane toads are very hardy individuals, and they uh, don't mind a little bit of bothering. But after a quick photo, we always make sure they're happy and on their way. Um, very cool to have a nice close encounter with an amphibian. And they're quite adorable, too. It's hard to resist taking a photo with them. And then Blue Creek is just, like I said, an amazing place to detach and unwind. Uh, there's a myriad of trails that stretch throughout the forest. And, you know, with no internet connection and very li uh, limited electricity, it's a great place to unwind and just get away from it all. So Blue Creek is one of my favorite places we travel to in Belize. Another place that we travel to is the Toucan Ridge Ecology and Education Society. And this area is in the heart of the Maya Mountains in central Belize. 
And it's 200 acres of trails and swimming holes and wonderful places to visit. And it borders the Saboon Forest Reserve, which is a huge reserve um, that protects acres upon acres in Belize. And so it's a great place also to hang out and enjoy the sights. Now, like I said, there's many trails and places to go find wildlife and go bird watching. Um, we can also find some pretty unusual um, creatures of the forest. And so this is a helmeted iguana, which is in the iguana family. And they're very rare to find because they're so cryptic. And in the forest, all they do is lay against a log or a, a twig and they disappear. They have this very cryptic camouflage and they're very hard to find. Uh, this past year we found two individuals and it's, I think the third one I've ever seen in my life. It was quite incredible. Um, and so we get to see many amazing reptiles as well as amphibians. And at trees or Toucan Ridge Ecology and Education Society, they perform research. It's a working research station. And so you get to witness interns and biologists working on various research projects that are happening at the station. So they have uh, have camera traps set up all over where they photograph animals passing through on their trails. And they've recorded three of the five cats in Belize, the jaguar, the jaguarundi, and the ocelot. But they've also seen uh, many large mammals and birds, including uh, they once caught a king vulture on their camera trap, which was quite incredible. So it's neat to see this um, research happening before your eyes. And on the way out of trees or going anywhere in country, we always break for wildlife too. And a common thing we find are snakes. And so this one time we had a beautiful green vine snake crossing the road and our bus driver stopped and jumped out and moved the snake off the road before it could get squished. And um, before we knew it, within five minutes, we attracted uh, like 20 to 30 people from a neighboring village that must have told their friends, hey, there's a gringo grabbing a snake. Because snakes are somewhat vilified in Belize and, uh, you know, most people unfortunately do not know the difference between a venomous snake and a, a, a snake that can't hurt you. And the green vine snake is completely harmless. And so it was a great teaching moment to educate people about the dangers of certain snakes versus not. And, you know, these people got a very up close and personal look at this amazing species of snake. And so we always make an effort to break for the snakes. And the last place we visit in Belize is Southwater Key. Now, Southwater Key is a 14-acre island that's located just off of Belize's central coast. It's about a 45-minute boat ride from the town of Dangriga. And, you know, 14 acres, it's pretty small. So 14 acres, that's um, to put it into time terms. If you were, It takes 10 minutes to walk from one end, end of the island to the other. And it is amazing. It's a beautiful place to hang out. Uh, go for um, a snorkel, uh, go for a nice swim, go kayaking, and we're able to use these uh, incredible facilities for our own use for a few days. Now, um, while we're there, we have many scheduled snorkeling trips. If you're a diver, you can dive. Um, I've actually yet to dive in Belize, but many people have told me it's amazing. Again, being the second largest barrier reef on the planet, diving is incredible. At certain times of the year, you can actually dive with whale sharks, which is the largest fish in the world. And they have some big ones that come nearby Belize. But green sea turtles and uh, large rays and sharks are common sites in Belize. Um, and so, yeah, we'll see lots of different wildlife. Um, one also thing, before I forget, that we like to see in Belize is we take a visit to Caribou Key, which is a Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. And it's just right next to Southwater Key. And so we get to meet, again, many scientists and biologists that are working on uh, the reef. And over a thousand papers have been published out of that research institute. And we're learning quite a bit about Belize's ecosystems on the ocean from this area. And so it's great we get to visit these amazing people and see what research they're doing. Now, the best part about Southwater Key, though, is at night. Uh, the stars are absolutely amazing. You can sometimes see the, the Milky Way and many shooting stars crossing over your head. Um, it's absolutely amazing place to see the stars. And usually on the way back to mainland, uh, we always make a stop at uh, Bird Key, or also called Manowar Key, um, where there is a... Um, a magnificent frigate bird and brown booby colony. And so you'll see hundreds of birds uh, fighting for nest space and having a grand old time. 
usually in the summer it's not breeding season so they're not as active but there's still tons of birds there so yes the frigate birds are if you can see in this photo the little red dots the males they're related to pelicans and they puff up their um their throat sacs and they have bright red um, throat so they use to advertise to attract um, females so it's quite a display and now so the question is will you join us in 2015 uh, we'll have about 19 to 20 spots on this upcoming trip and we would love for you to join us in this amazing country um, belize again is a place that's near and dear to my heart and so i do hope you can join us on our next eco tour to belize and with that, I want to thank you for your support and for joining me on this webinar. Please, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at Starkey, S-T-A-R-K-E-Y, at savethefrogs.com. I'd love to talk your ear off about Belize's amphibians or invite you to join our next eco tour. So I hope to hear from you soon, and thanks for learning all about Belize.